do you think a first trimester fetus has moral value? Okay, so a first trimester fetus has moral value because whether you consider it a potential human life or, an, or a full-on human life, it has more value than just a cluster of cells. If left to its natural processes, it will grow into a baby. So the real question is, where do you draw the line? So you can draw the line at the heartbeat because it's very hard to draw the line at the heartbeat. There are people who are adults who are alive because of a pacemaker. They need some sort of outside force generating their heartbeat. Okay, are you going to do it based on brain function? Okay, well, what about people who are in a coma? Should we just kill them? Right? The problem is anytime you draw any line other than the inception of the child, you end up drawing a false line that can also be applied to people who are adults. So either human life has intrinsic value or it doesn't. I think we both agree that adult human life has intrinsic value. Can we start from that premise? I believe that sentience um, has, is what gives something moral value, not, okay, necessarily, so, not necessarily being a human alone. Okay, because, so, or, when you're, so when you're asleep, can I stab you? I'm still considered sentient when I'm asleep. Okay, if you are in a coma from which you may awake, can I stab you? Well then, uh, no. I guess not. I mean, like, well, I'm glad you answered that because I have no interest in actually murdering that's, you. But that's, so, but that's still potential sentience and it's still a potential... Like, I agree, go, like, it is potential sentience. sentience. You know what okay. else is potential sentience? Being right. a fetus. The, the issue with that... Uh, the issue I have with that though is that um, in, if, if I'm in a coma and I'm not like doing anything to anyone, I'm not causing any issues amongst the world, whereas a, 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 an un, an unwanted child may or may not be a burden to people. Okay, well, there are be, lots of people who are unwanted, right? right? I mean, there are lots of people's parents who are unwanted, right? We're a bunch of college students. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the problem is that now, so now you're shifting the argument, right? Before you were making the argument based on the intrinsic value of a life based on sentience, and now you're talking about the level of burden that somebody presents as a separate moral argument. Okay, I don't believe that you being a burden on somebody is justification for them killing you, as a general rule. I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I appreciate you and thank you. No, thanks. <laughs> Hi. Um, so, very much not a fan, but decided well, thank to you come for coming. anyways. Okay, it's like an uh, Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, I actually have two questions. Um, right. The first one is how do you account for um, like statistical manipulation when you present your facts that you presented in the beginning? So, more specifically, um, when you're talking about percentages of blacks in X, Y, and Z, and um, when you're talking about the um, differences in wages today versus, you know, 20 to 50 years ago, how do you account for, A, the difference in population among blacks versus whites or other races, and um, B, how do you account for the increasing gap between the middle class and the upper class? Okay, so... Sorry, two things. Uh, so uh, there, there are two questions there. On any given statistic, uh, I would bet we'd have a more productive conversation if I could actually give you the source. You could look up the source and then you could ask specific questions about how those numbers were arrived at because I'm giving you the bottom line, but I'm happy to give you the footnotes. Uh, I typically don't do that because it makes the speech even longer and more boring than it already is. Um, but, it's, it, but I'm more than happy to, to argue the stats and whether they're good or not because you might, it might be like that, that other guy questioning the, the Bureau of Justice statistics stats. Right? There might be a flaw in the stat and then we can argue about that. So that's a good question. Uh, the answer is we'll look at each individual stat and we'll determine whether we think that it's, it's reflective of reality or not based on its internal logic. Uh, as, far as, the, uh, as far as the idea that how do I account for the gap between the, the upper class and, uh, and the non-upper class, as I said, number one, it's not the same people in the upper class, right? People move up and down between classes fairly regularly in the United States. Uh, there is a widening gap in terms of the people who are earning the most and the people who are earning the least, but that's because if you had to make a chart, it, would, it wouldn't look like this. It wouldn't look like the people at the top are going like that and people at the bottom are going like that. It would look like this, right? People at the bottom are moving up slightly, and the people at the top are moving up rapidly. That's because investment income has done really well under the stock market, for example. So if you had money to put in the stock market, that's been doing really well for you over the past several years, which suggests that one of the ways that you get out of poverty is to save and then get into the stock market. Right? The, the point here is that when people focus on income inequality, I think that this is a, actually a rather large moral mistake. I think that, that focusing on poverty is a good thing to do. I think focusing on income inequality is not a good thing to do because there's no correlation between income inequality and relative rates of poverty. Right? There's tremendous income inequality in a lot of places on planet Earth. In fact, in all places on planet Earth. If you go to Sudan, there's going to be a rich warlord there, and then there's going to be a bunch of people living on $6 a year. Okay? That, that's a terrible place to live. Income inequality in the United States is also quite high. Right? There are people who are Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, and then there's the, the, the local checker at your grocery store. But 
if the local checker or grocery store is getting richer, then it seems to me they have nothing particularly to complain about in how the economy is operating. They don't have a right to Jeff Bezos' money. They don't have a right to Bill Gates' money any more than Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos has a right to their money. So the question shouldn't be relative rates of increase. The question should be, are, is your income increasing? Is your life getting better? Can you buy more cool stuff? And one of the problems I have with just measuring income by the pure dollar amount is that it doesn't actually measure what you can buy with those dollars. Right? The fact is that you can buy things today that you couldn't buy even five years ago, certainly not 10 or 20 years ago. Life is completely transformed. A poor person in the United States today is living better than a rich person was living in the United States in 1920. Right? They all have, everybody has air conditioning, everybody has a microwave, everybody has a car, everybody has a TV or two. Right? All of these things did not exist. That's because the market has created new products for which there is demand. That does not mean that poverty has been completely solved because I think it's going to be almost impossible to completely solve poverty. But it does mean that if you're complaining because people at the upper end are getting richer rather than because you're getting poorer, then you should look to whether you are operating on the basis of jealousy or that you're operating on the basis of something that, uh, that actually should matter. Okay. Um, the second point was um, just... Like, as a woman and somebody going into the healthcare field, I personally don't, it's on your opinion on abortion. Um, I personally don't think that, like, I could have an abortion just because morally I feel like for myself it wouldn't be the right choice. Um, but how do you defend your opinion as a white, well-off, religious man? Um, how do you defend your, ha like, telling a woman what she can do with because her body? Because evil things are still evil, even if I'm a white, well-off, religious man. And good things are still good, even if I'm a white girl off the religious man. So the, I mean, this is, the, this is, this is one of these, this is one of these identity politics points that I really, uh, I mean, I, I don't mean to come down harshly on you, I don't, uh, but it, it, it is a point that I really have serious moral qualms with. I, I think it's quite, quite terrible. The reason being that the people who were fighting against enslavement of black people were a bunch of well-off white men for the most part. Right? And those people were saying, this is a moral sin. This is a moral blot. They weren't living in the South. They didn't own plantations. They didn't live the lives of the plantation owners. They said, this is evil, and we are here to stop it. Right? When you see something that you think is morally wrong happening, especially when you're talking about the taking of a human life, like, listen, I think that, uh, I think that you shouldn't go around randomly killing homeless people. I just have this view. I'm not a homeless person. Most of the people who randomly kill homeless people are probably not of my economic strata, my religious view, or my, uh, I don't know whether they're of my skin color or not. I have no idea what the, what the actual sociological breakdown of homeless killer serial murderers is, but, uh, but I would suggest that my identity has nothing to do with what is right or wrong. And this is what Western civilization used to be about. Western civilization used to be about the idea that, yes, I'm not a woman in the healthcare field, but you and I can have a conversation about what's right and wrong because this is the nature of human reason. The nature of human reason, the nature of right and wrong, is that you and I can talk about what's right and wrong and that I don't retreat into my identity. If we can all retreat into our identity and our morality is now centered around that identity, morality doesn't exist at all. We break down into a society of fragmented atoms where I can't even say, like, you're torturing a puppy in your backyard. I have nothing to say about that. I'm not a white woman who's in the healthcare field. I'm not going to do that. I don't, I don't, I, I refuse to surrender the idea that I can have a moral stance on issues that are of concern to society and of concern to the, to the well-being of the United States simply because of the color of my skin or the nature of my genitalia. And honestly, I believe any view that feels differently is sexist, racist, and bigoted. Ed, do you think that women who voted for Hillary Women who have strongly supported the feminist movement and supported the left are feeling disenfranchised given the current climate of sexual brutality and oppression brought to light in Hollywood recently? Uh, so I think that people have a willingness to blind themselves to facts that they don't want to see. And so what I've seen a lot is people saying, well, the problem of sexual harassment isn't unique to Hollywood and has nothing to do with our culture regarding sex, a leftist culture regarding sex. No, it has to do generally with men. Right? It has to do generally with American society. It has to do generally with power relationships. Uh, it's funny how everybody is willing to generalize as soon as their ox is gored. Right? As, soon as, as soon as the left sees, wait, our culture, our feminist culture that we said that we were going to promulgate and was going to protect women hasn't protected women you know, nearly at all, then all of a sudden it turns into, well, it's not us that sin. It's men that sin. Right? And, and so I've been getting a lot of this online in the last couple of days. It's, it's you men who haven't stood up. And I keep saying, like, what do you want me to do and I'll do it? Really, what do you want me to do? Like, if you show me a rapist like Harvey Weinstein allegedly is, then I will say, send him to jail or castrate him, right? Like, th this is not difficult. But if you just say to me, you don't acknowledge the rape culture, again, I need you to define that, and I need you to explain to me what I did. 
Like, really? Uh, like, I didn't do anything. Um, and I think the vast majority of people in this room didn't do anything. And if they did do something, then maybe people should report it to the police, because that seems to me the best way to root out evil is to actually have law enforcement get involved. Um, so the, the left is, so the question of what the left is doing about this, do they feel disenfranchised? Uh, no, I think they're just going to blame the same people they always blame, because we're all in our own little bubbles. Should they feel disenfranchised? 100%. Because in a society that treats sex as transactional, in a society that basically reduces sex to any sort, uh, just a, a physical transaction that is based solely on consent, it makes it very difficult to explain why it is that the casting couch in Hollywood is bad per se. Right? There's actually, like, uh, feminist theory says that it's bad because of power imbalances, but the sort of libertarian culture of the left suggests that power imbalance doesn't have anything to do with it. If I feel like trading my body for a part in a movie, well, that's my business. And if you say differently, then you're slut shaming me. Right, so that's, well, you can't really have it both ways. Either it's bad or it's not bad. Uh, and if we are going to fight sexual harassment and sexual assault, it seems to me that we have to do a couple of things. One, we have to reinvest sex with value beyond just a physical transaction. It's not just two people who are getting each other's rocks off. It actually means something beyond that. There's a relationship that's attached to it. Um, and beyond that, I think that we need to re-inculcate in men themselves, not just the teach men not to rape routine, like, again, it's such a weird concept. Like, when I was 11, my dad didn't sit me down and say, son, don't rape people. <laughs> like, like, if you have to teach your child that, my guess is that you got a bigger problem than that on your hands. Um, <laughs> what my dad taught me was to be a gentleman and to treat women with respect. And that has to do with being a gentleman and recognizing differences in sex roles. Because one of the things that's happened is that traditional masculinity, the idea that it is a man's job to protect women, this is one of our jobs as human beings, as men, to protect women, the feminist movement doesn't like that. Well, then you can't blame us for not protecting women if you don't want us to protect women. Like, I want to protect women. I think men should protect women. I think one of the reasons God put man on earth is to protect women. Okay, well, then it is incumbent on me to protect women. But if you're telling me that I can't even open a door for a woman because this is somehow an offense to her honor, and that if I say that it's man's job to protect women, that this is somehow reinforcing gender stereotypes, then don't come whining to me when bad stuff happens. Because the, the answer to bad behavior is good behavior. The answer to vice is virtue. Uh, the answer to vice isn't just yelling